On today's gangster profile, Georgie McLaughlin. Georgie boy, oh Georgie boy. Georgie McLaughlin was the youngest brother of the vicious McLaughlin brothers who ran the Charlestown Rackets in the late 50s and early 60s. He also has the dubious distinction of sparking off the bloodiest gangland war in the city of Boston's history, the 1960s Boston Irish Gang War. Although starting this war by receiving a handful of beatings on Labor Day weekend, Georgie sat out most of the war in a jail cell charged with a murder that many say he did not commit. A jail cell was probably the safest place to be in Boston in the 1960s, where the life of a street hood was very cheap indeed. By the early 1900s, the higher class Irish townies lived on the top of the hills that dotted the Charlestown area. The McLaughlins lived right at the bottom of the hill, underneath the elevated rail system that kept the whole neighborhood in a shadow and kicked up black soot all day. A railroad clerk named Johnny McLaughlin and his rather large wife Annie lived in a three-story wood tenement on Main Street. These houses were pretty common for the time for large Irish families. This was a time when Irish families would hold wakes for their dead family members right in their own parlor on the first floor of the family house. Drinks would be passed right above their dearly departed and old Irish songs sung. The McLaughlins had a respectable litter of six girls and five boys. This was pretty common size for Irish Catholic families in Boston at the time. Most of the gangsters that were involved in the 1960s gang war, like the McLaughlins, grew up in a time of extreme poverty and want. Not to mention the worldwide bloodbath that was World War II made death and, suf death and suffering kind of a trivial matter to this generation. I believe that's why a lot of these guys didn't hold a lot of value on the human being's life. The younger brothers like Edward Punchy, Bernard Bernie, and Baby George took to the streets and crime at a very early age. Other townies residents reflected, Those three boys were out on the street too much, even as young kids. Can't blame the parents though, raising a family 40 years ago is a rough job. A Boston cop wasn't quite so kind with his reflection, calling the brothers low, animal-like cheap thieves and petty shoplifters. George was a small guy with a baby face. He tried desperately to get into the Navy, but he couldn't make the weight requirement, so he ate endless amounts of mashed potatoes to gain entrance. But his Navy career was a disaster. After being court-martialed, a psychiatrist declared Georgie possessed a psychopathic personality with marked aggressive traits. Kind of like how the paper later described him as, quote, a nut who would shoot his best friend if his back were turned. But later in life, his prison acquaintances would call him Gentleman Georgie. Who knows? Either way, on his return to Charlestown after the Navy, he took right to a life of crime. Within a year, he found himself in Concord Reformatory for an armed assault. Georgie got a large tattoo of an eagle that went right across his whole chest to try to look intimidating, but at 5'5 five five and 156 pounds, he wasn't very physically imposing. One of his contemporaries said, He didn't have to be big. Georgie would cut your balls off as soon as look at you. When Georgie was on the streets, he worked as a laborer and a longshoreman. His older brothers used the cover as longshoremen to shake down the Union and control and pilfer the Charlestown waterfront in the 1950s. Although Georgie was listed on paper as a longshoreman, in actuality, the majority of the time Georgie was on the streets, he was piss drunk. Unfortunately for Georgie McLaughlin, he was a vicious alcoholic. This is most likely the reason you get conflicting stories about his personality. This is very common with alcoholics and addicts, the whole Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing. Some people remember Georgie as quiet and polite with looks similar to an altar boy, while others described him as vicious and violent. Mostly likely, these were differing states of sobriety and intoxication. He spent the majority of his time on the streets in various Charlestown bars and taverns getting wasted. His brothers Bernie and Punchy were more heavily involved in the rackets and were more business-minded. Georgie was their wild card. One of Georgie's best buddies was Towny Hood Harold Hannon, who once kidnapped the manager of a roadside Howard Johnson's in order to try to steal $3,000. Hannon is most well known for being one of the most gruesome murders in the Irish gang war. His nude and badly tortured and beaten body was found floating in the Boston Harbor after it was dumped there most likely by Winter Hill Associates. Hannon and Georgie represented the crazy and unstable wing of a crazy and unstable gang. 
The FBI claims that these two committed mur murders for hire for mobsters throughout the United States, but who knows the validity of anything the FBI says about the McLaughlins or of anything really, period. The Boston FBI office did not like the McLaughlins. Actually, agents Paul Rico and Dennis Condon hated them, especially Agent Rico. H. Paul Rico came from an affluent background and would have had absolutely nothing in common with the Charlestown McLaughlins. The unmarried bachelor Rico is rumored to enjoy the company of other men rather than females. There have been long-standing rumors around the FBI and their stocking-wearing director, J. Edgar Hoover. It has been said that Hoover himself was a closeted homosexual and recruited other agents who, although seemed Christian and wholesome, were also closet cases themselves. The Charlestown guys somehow got a hold of this information and would joke about Rico's proclivities. This got back to Rico and it made him red hot. Asian Condon himself of Irish heritage and a lifelong resident of Charlestown probably just looked down at the McLaughlins like some sort of low-life towny trash. Either way, the two most prolific special agents in the city of Boston during the 1960s had no love for the Charlestown gang. Unfortunately, if nothing else, George McLaughlin will always be known as the man who sparked off the notorious Boston Irish Gang War of the 1960s. The obnoxiousness and depraved behavior of drunk George McLaughlin started something of a grand scale. I bet nobody there that weekend would have ever believed such a thing was going to happen. George hopped in a car with someone and made his way to the seacoast town of Salisbury, Mass. Among the beachside cottages that are piled on top of each other at Salisbury Beach, many Bostonians would revel on such holiday weekends. I'm imagining Georgie hopping into someone's car and heading north of the city for the holiday. I'm sure soon after arriving in Salisbury Beach, Georgie became inebriated and whoever he was probably there tried to lose him as soon as possible. Legend has it, and I stress legend has it, that a cock Georgie said something fresh to a young lady at one of these college parties, and the king of Summer Hill, Buddy McLean, the people's champion, would not let the dishonor of a young woman go unavenged. So of course Buddy handed old Georgie an epic beating. Georgie took his licks and moved on down the beach. He ended up at a different cottage where he continued to get drunk, probably a second or third drunk of the day. This guy, I'm telling you, was a prolific drinker. At this cottage, he took his depraved behavior to the next level, and he apparently he fondled a woman's bosom. This woman's husband, Bill Hickey, was not a fan of this behavior, and a brawl ensued. Georgie, being pissed drunk and much smaller, looked for an equalizer. He broke the whiskey bottle they had been drinking from and tried to stab Hickey in the face with it. At this, Hickey's friend, Red Lloyd, jumped in, and the two nearly stomped Georgie to death. They picked up his unconscious body and dumped it in one of the winding alleys between the cottages and went and had a drink. There was the two men who later came to their senses and retrieved George here. Someone else found him in an alley. Someone and brought him to the nearby Anna Jake's Hospital in Newburyport where he convalesced for two weeks. When questioned by local police, he said he'd handle it himself. Most people know what took place from here. Georgie's brother Bernie went to Buddy McLean and ordered they serve the two men up, to which McLean declined. The McLaughlins then tried to put a bomb underneath the McLean family car, so the day after Buddy McLean shot Bernie McLaughlin dead in Charlestown Square in broad daylight in front of hundreds of witnesses, allegedly. And thus, the Great Boston Irish Gang War of the 1960s was unleashed. Over the next few years, dozens of men would die due to the conflict. A lot of men having nothing to do with the groups that were originally involved. The gang war became an excuse for old scores to be settled in the city and for the Italian mafia to do a little house cleaning. Georgie, who was ultimately responsible for starting the war, missed most of it sitting in a prison cell. On March 15, 1964, at the Orchard Park Housing Projects, a party was being held by the Buckley family for a child's christening. Georgie was holed up with a 35-year-old divorcee named Maureen Delamano, who lived with her mother on the first floor of the Orchard Park Project apartment. After cruising around Boston with notorious hitman Elmer Trigger Burke, Georgie was laying low in Roxbury away from his Charlestown neighborhood. Up on the third floor, the Buckleys were having a party for a child's christening. I'm not sure why a child's christening is a reason for adults to drink till 11 o'clock at night, but that's probably where my parenting instincts differ from my parents and older generations. But anyhow... After 11 p.m., a 21-year-old freckled-faced young man named William Sheridan got into an argument with the host's aunt and left the party. A little bit after midnight, the party started to die down. 
Georgie tried to get one of the Buckleys to make a beer run, but he said it was too late and the party was over. Apparently at that point, Georgie was aggravated and was trying to clear people out of the apartment in the hallway. Sheridan apparently returned and tried to apologize to the aunt with one of the Buckleys telling him to do it later. This is where things get murky. One story states that Georgie got into an argument with a man who wouldn't surrender his beer bottle and he went downstairs in De- into Delamano's apartment and when he came out with a gun, he bumped into Sheridan in the hallway. A supposed witness, a Marine, outside said that he saw Georgie say something to Sheridan before, shout- before shooting him in the head. Someone also reported that Maureen Delamano came running upstairs yelling, Georgie shot someone! Get him out of here! People scattered out of the apartment building as Sheridan's body lay halfway out of the front door. Kids thinking someone was lighting off cherry bombs in the projects yelled, Woohoo! When police showed up in force, Georgie was long gone, and now he was public enemy on the run. Georgie would always say that he was innocent of this crime, and he was the victim of a law enforcement setup. Georgie claimed that the bullet that killed Sheridan was actually meant for Georgie himself. He said that a sniper positioned himself in the parking lot of the Orchard Park housing projects and shot through an open door and struck Sheridan right between the eyes, missing Georgie. He claimed law enforcement knew this and they didn't care because they hated him and wanted him off the streets. The ballistics would point to Georgie's story being true. It would seem that Sheridan was killed by a long-range shot instead of a close-range gunshot. It is well known that the FBI and the BPD were notoriously corrupt in the 1960s and they could make crimes look any way they wanted them to. It is widely accepted now that George McLaughlin did not kill William Sheridan but was set up for the crime by law enforcement to get him off the street. Him being there at the time of the crime was enough for them. Law enforcement were sure that hoodlum Harold Hannon helped Georgie escape from the Orchard Park Project's murder scene, but shortly after, Hannon was found floating in Boston Harbor. Authorities were pretty sure Dorchester thug Spike O'Toole, one of the few Charlestown allies left on the street, was harboring the fugitive of Georgie. When Spike was questioned at a cocktail lounge if he knew where Georgie was, he responded, I don't know the bum! After Spike and a hot 20-year-old woman rented the second and third floors of a Dorchester triple-decker, they began being surveilled. Dennis Condon and the FBI, through his informants, found Georgie before Winter Hill did and the feds were ready to pounce. Agent Paul Rico, after hearing the McLaughlin gang's disparaging remarks about him on a wiretap, planned on executing Georgie upon arrest. He approached Cadillac Frank Salemi, who he was grooming for information, not intercourse, and asked him for a throwaway revolver that he could plant on McLaughlin after he killed him to make him look like he was armed. Salemi obliged. Rico stated, If I get the opportunity to bang Georgie McLaughlin, I'm going to do it. At around 2 p.m. on February 24, 1965, 20 FBI agents and Boston policemen descended on an address on Duke Street in Dorchester. After ringing a useless buzzer, Agent Leonard Frizzoli announced that FBI and BPD were there. A few minutes later, he heard footsteps. The door opened to a small child, and halfway up the stairs was a very attractive woman, Frances Bethoni. We're looking for George McLaughlin, they announced. Francis tried to object, but was brushed aside by law enforcement agents as they moved through the house. They already knew the layout of the building, and they moved towards a third-floor attic where they believed McLaughlin was. As they burst into a third-floor bedroom, Spike O'Toole and Georgie lay oblivious to the commotion downstairs. Georgie yelled, Don't shoot! Don't shoot! He must have instinctively known that the agents wanted him dead. They forced the two gangsters to the floor and cuffed them. But for whatever bizarre FBI reason, they stripped Georgie down to his tidy whities and moved him out. Spike and Bethoni, along with Georgie's girl, Maureen Delamano, were arrested for harboring a fugitive and and accessories after the fact of murder. Georgie kicked at reporters snapping pictures outside. He snarled, My name is George McLaughlin, and that's all I gotta say to you. Rico came to the garage after the arrest and gloomily told Salami, Four out of the five agents were on board with snuffing out Georgie, but because of one holdout, Rico could not go through with it. But he kept the gun, Salami noted. Georgie awaited his murder trial in the dilapidated medieval-style Charles Street Jail. So bad were the jail's conditions that prisoners would admit to crimes they didn't commit just to get sentenced and move to a different prison. Georgie was put in a cell in the secluded section of the jail because he was a high-profile prisoner. Out of fear, he barely left his cell. His living conditions were absolutely atrocious. His one-handed brother, Edward Punchy McLaughlin, who had already survived two murder attempts, would come every day to his brother's trial as a show of solidarity. 
The court was under heavy security, so Punchy felt secure when he was at the court, but was vulnerable coming and going. He had lost a hand during the second attempt on his life, and unfortunately for Punchy, he was caught at the West Roxbury bus stop coming to his brother's trial one morning and was brutally murdered. The trial was largely a farce, and the fix was in from the beginning. The prosecution produced witnesses, and the jury was convinced. George, who is unusually pale from his lack of sunlight, said only this, I had a brother killed coming to this trial. I tell you, the shot that killed Sheridan was meant for me. When the verdict of guilty was announced, George just stared blankly ahead and squeezed Maureen Delamano's hand, who was standing next to him. The judge asked if there was any reason why the death penalty should not be imposed. Georgie mumbled, I have no comment, to which the, du- the judge announced that he should suffer punishment by death. Shortly after his trial, Massachusetts abolished the death penalty, and George McLaughlin's death sentence was reduced to natural life without the possibility for parole. Whether or not George McLaughlin committed a crime he was imprisoned for, by being a prison he survived the Irish gang war. Both his brothers, along with the notorious Hughes brothers, were killed and their gang was wiped off the map. Thanks to the FBI and the Italian Mafia, the Winter Hill Gang won the gang war and things in the Boston underworld would drastically change as a result. The man who was responsible for all this and his drunken actions on one Labor Day weekend would outlive everyone else involved. George McLaughlin finally passed away in 2002 in the Mass State prison system. He spent most of his prison sentence at MCI Norfolk in relative peace and quiet. I always felt like Georgie got a raw deal, but who knows, maybe he was content in prison. If you like this video, hit the that old like button. Subscribe if you're not already. I forgive you for such transgressions. Comment, make requests, but most importantly folks, and this is non-negotiable. Take good care of yourselves, and have a great day.